You're listening to the Truth About Bible Study taught by Pastor Dan Christians at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Well, thank you all for coming this morning. Um, Just a reminder, if at any point in the class you have a question or a comment or something to add or something that I forgot or something that I said really wrong that I didn't notice, then please put up your hand and tell me that. Okay, because that's a, I appreciate that, and I think a lot of times um, you add so much more to the discussion if you participate. So please do that. Um, this morning, I would like to begin our third and final lesson on the topic of the truth about marriage. At the commencement of the class, I outlined that my goal for this class, the Truth About series, was that we were going to be speaking about issues that are controversial either within the culture or within the church. And we're going to try and go to what the Bible says about those issues and try and um, help ourselves establish some Christian thinking, biblical thinking on all of these issues that are sometimes really misunderstood within the church and within the culture. And, And a lot of places that we are going to be clashing with the culture. And so we need to know very firmly what the Bible says. And so I would love to spend weeks teaching a class about marriage, but that's way beyond the scope of our class, and uh, 12 years of marriage certainly does not qualify one to do that, and so we're not going to do that. The the goal of this class was just to look at marriage and see where culture and the church sometimes clash against what the Bible teaches about marriage. So we're going to finish today and then move on from here and talk about, I think we're going to talk about money next week. So what, what money is for and what we should be thinking about it. Anyways, for these reasons, we'll continue from last week. Um, We're attempting to learn what Scripture teaches about God's design, purpose, and plan for marriage. Today, we're going to finish our discussion on the God-given marital roles by turning our attention to God's design and instructions for the wife. Um, We covered God's design for marriage as a whole last week, and then God's design for the man's role last week. And so now we're going to look at the female role in marriage, and then we'll move on and we'll look at why homosexual marriage, why polygamous marriage doesn't fit into God's plan. And so before we get into all of that, and before I make a mess of all of that, I want to make one very important point, just so that I don't run out of time at the end, just so that this isn't something that seems like it's tagged on. I think this is something essential to say. And that is that marriage is a wonderful gift of God to mankind. But marriage is not the highest calling for any man or any woman. It is not the pinnacle of manhood and womanhood. Um, You are not incomplete as a Christian, as a man, as a woman, as a human being without a spouse. The most important relationship that you have is not that with your spouse, it is, is with your Savior. The most important union you have is the union you have with your Savior. Your most important calling is is a calling to do God's will in your life. And so I wanted to make it very clear that when we talk about marriage and we look at what the Bible says, sometimes it it can feel like people who aren't married feel like, okay, well, I've just, I, I haven't been completed yet or something. That's just not the case. Now, that's not to say that marriage should be avoided. It's, it's not. It's a good gift of God. A godly marriage is a holy pursuit. And I think it's safe to say that a godly marriage is a, a good pursuit for most young, young adults. I think that's the direction that most of them will go in their lives, and I think that's God's plan. The Bible makes it very clear that, in fact, Paul even seems to indicate that if people were able to be single, now clearly everybody can't do this, but if Christians were able to be single and were given the gift of singleness, they would be freed up to serve God entirely. And what he's saying there when he speaks in First in Corinthians 7 is he's just making the point that when you are a spouse, you have obligations and responsibilities to your spouse. And those obligations and responsibilities can and will at times take you away from what you could be doing for the work of the Lord. And so if you're like Paul and you have a gift of singleness, then embrace that and use it for the work of the Lord. Understand that 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 is a a gift that is sanctified, that your life is sanctified to God's work in that case. And so use that for that calling. Um, It is much better to live a single life to the glory of God than to marry the wrong person just because you thought marriage would complete you. And so, I didn't want to get through this whole lesson on marriage without saying something like that, and I hope that makes sense. 
Okay, so let's just do a quick review from what we've seen last week. Actually, we'll pray and then we'll do that. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this morning. I thank you that you've gathered us here today. And Lord, I thank you for the Bible and how it gives such clear instruction for us on marriage. And I pray that you'd help us this morning to, uh, to think your thoughts on it, to think biblically. And I pray, God, that that'll do a few things, that it'll help us to um, be better equipped to engage our culture and to answer questions that are asked of us. And also, Lord, that, that if those of us that are married here, that we would um, think about what your design and purpose for marriage is and, and just take an account. It's just a reminder of um, what we're supposed to be striving toward and that you'd help us to do a better job of that, Lord. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you died for us and that um, with marriage we have this opportunity to show um, this glorious picture of the gospel. And we love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The popular view of marriage. Within our society, um, we've seen that, as a whole, the institution of marriage is on the decline. And as it declines, so does the honor or the respect that is generally due to marriage, that, that is generally being given to marriage in the past. It's no longer there. And people are growing up with many alternative lifestyles in mind, uh, many of which do include a partner, but don't include marriage. And we've seen our society kind of slowly get there, but I think we're at the point where we can look back 20 and 30 years and see this shocking change in the way marriage is viewed. And I mean, it should alarm us to an extent, um, but I also think that as we look at that, we shouldn't look at, look at this idea of marriage and say, oh, that's great. Marriage is just failing. No, marriage isn't failing. Some people in society, their view of marriage is wrong. And so we're seeing the result of that. But this is actually an opportunity for Christians to step up and try and have godly marriages, marriages that glorify God, that are built upon the principles of God's word, and show that there actually is a significant difference between what a Christian marriage looks like and what society's understanding of marriage is. That actually the Christian view of marriage is beautiful. That's what it's supposed to be. And so before we assume that our culture is right about marriage and that it really isn't important, we should go to the Bible and we should find that it is a holy institution that's worth pursuing. It's not designed to make us happy. It's not designed to make us complete. God does have a purpose in our marriage to sanctify us in our lives and to be a witness to the world around us. So marriage, God's founding and purpose, it was created by God. It was a covenant between God a man and a woman, is a supernatural one flesh union. The purpose is to um, be a picture to display the glory of God in the gospel. And we saw last time that the Christian view of marriage is unique. Um, Sinclair Ferguson said this, and I thought this was a a great quote that kind of summarized what we said last week about marriage and it being um, unique as a Christian thing. He said, we should not make the mistake of thinking that marriage will provide the ultimate satisfaction for which we all hunger. And I think that when we look at that statement, we say, okay, the ultimate satisfaction, well, maybe we wouldn't think that, but we certainly think that marriage is going to provide this this sense of satisfaction that we're hungering for. And so he's saying we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that all of a sudden when we're married, this, this satisfaction, this hunger is going to be satiated. We're going to feel so much better about who we are, and what place we're at in our lives. He said, to assume so would be to to be guilty of blasphemy. Only God satisfies the hungry heart. Marriage is but one of the channels he uses to enable us to taste how deeply satisfying his thirst-quenching grace can be. And I loved how that was stated, because first it gets to the point that Marriage isn't designed just to make you happy and to satisfy your needs, but that God is the one to do that. But the God, who's the giver of all good gifts, has given a gift of marriage where in, in marriage we get a small taste of what is deeply satisfying. I think that, that kind of summarizes our thought and what our thought should be about the purpose of marriage. Um, if our purpose for marriage is our mutual happiness, our marriage will be a failure. If our purpose for marriage lines up with God's purpose, our marriage will be a success. Uh, We saw last week that it is not love that sustains a marriage, but marriage that sustains the love. So a healthy marriage will be a happy marriage. So that's that's a little bit about why God designed marriage, what its purpose would be, and what it should be doing in our lives. 
Um, so we saw last week then that in Ephesians chapter 5 that marriage is God's design. How does marriage display the glory of God in the gospel? So, so we can say that a lot, and we can say, well, marriage is for the glory of God, but eventually we have to get to nuts and bolts. Eventually we have to say, okay, exactly how does this work? And we see in Ephesians 5 how it works. And last week we kind of worked backwards. We saw that the goal of marriage from verses 31 to 33 is that the gospel, the picture of the gospel, is on full display. And marriage is much more beautiful when you know what it's pointing toward. Something that is beautiful, something that is eternal, something that is glorious. And the intimacy of marriage points us to the intimacy that we will have with Christ, or that we do have with Christ. And so a gospel picture has differing roles for the husband and for the wife. And we looked last week at man's responsibility, that men are commanded to sacrificially, sanctifyingly, and selfishly love their wives. Sacrificially, we're called to give of ourselves as Christ gave the church. Um, sanctifyingly, that we're to prepare her to meet her Lord, and selfishly, that we're to treat her like you would your own body. You care for, you purify, you protect. And then we saw the woman's responsibility, and that's what we're going to look at today. And so if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Here's the woman's responsibility in marriage, and this is where sometimes we can get ourselves into trouble with people. But we, what we want to do here is we want to just look very clearly about what the Bible says and then follow what the Bible says and not add to it and not take away from it. And I think sometimes we're guilty of that when we try and make this definition of, of how this all works too specific. And what we want to do is just say, this is what the Bible says, no more, no less. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Here we see, first of all, God commands voluntary submission. Doormats don't get to choose to be doormats. Okay? God is not calling somebody to just be a doormat because that's just what they are. God is calling for voluntary submission. It's a gift that you give your husband in obedience to God. It does not make you a doormat. It does not mean that you do everything that you're told. It does not mean that your opinion is superfluous, that it's unnecessary, that it's invalid. It doesn't mean that it's, it's less important than that of your husband's. Um, it doesn't mean that y you don't think as well. It doesn't diminish your ability. It doesn't diminish your role, your contribution to the marriage. It, it doesn't do any of those things. This call to voluntary sm submission is for a very specific purpose, and it is very high calling. And this is where our culture gets it wrong. And this is why, unfortunately, many Christian women who are trying to live at what the Bible says to do in marriage feel as though the culture looks down on them. Like they've, like they've given up some kind of fight that they should be fighting. Like they've, they've resigned themselves to be second-class citizens. When in, fact, when in fact, I'd say the Bible is the book that gives men and women equal importance, equal value. At no point does God say, uh, well, this is the man's role and this is the woman's role, and clearly the man's role is more important. Clearly this part of the picture is the really good part, and the other part is just, yeah, okay, it's there, but it's kind of unnecessary. That's not it at all. Voluntary submission is an incredibly difficult thing. Can I tell you something? I'm an assistant pastor. So within that title, you understand that, that there is some level of leadership and also some level of submission, right? And I find that oftentimes the leadership part is easier. A lot of times it's easier to step in into a room and to take control and kind of be the one that people are looking to than it is to defer to someone else, to someone else's authority. And someone else. So what I'm saying is what women are being called to is a very, it's a, it's a difficult thing. It's a high calling. And if you don't do your part well, there's nothing that the man can or should do to put you in line. He has no enforcement mechanism. This is all between you and God. And so God is calling you specifically to something. It literally means to submit, to come under another mission. To come under another mission. 
And that's where we see two people who are joined together, working together for a common cause. So you allow him to be the head. You, you voluntarily get in line with your husband. And listen, this doesn't mean that for some reason the man is automatically more spiritual or smarter than the wife. Oftentimes that's not the case. But the rules don't change. Okay, now every man would be very wise to listen to his wife, to learn what she has to say. A lot of people are nodding when I say this. It's good. If you're, if you're a man who thinks that you just know all the answers and you don't need the input of your wife, you're a fool. You're an absolute fool because you do. And God gave you her because you need her. Yes? I really like what you just said with the sub mission. I've never really heard that before. But ahead of that, there must be a main mission mm-hmm. and a sub mission. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Eric. And you know what's interesting about this, this submission is that although the wife is called to, to get in line with this other mission, the husband is being called to get in line with a different mission. And so in everything that we do for the Lord, we are called to submit. And so the wife's call to submission looks a little bit different than the husband's. But the husband is still called to submit his will and his way to God's and to sacrificially give of himself to the church, to, to his wife. And so the way that he submits looks different than his wife, but it's still submission. It's still submission to God's call in his life. It's still submission to God's commands for him as a husband. So we are all called to submit. So it says to submit. Number two, it says to your own husbands. It doesn't call you submit to every husband or every man. Well, I'm just thinking, like, when you think about the way the world calls husbands to treat their wives, people, the world asks that they treat them as equals, whereas Christ asks that the husbands treat their wives as he did in the church. So there's mm-hmm. love. Amen. Really, when you, it's the easy comparison. I'm just like, if my husband obeys what scripture tells me, he loves me far more and treats me far better than. That's, a, that's a, absolutely right, Sam. Yeah, if, if you didn't hear what she said, what she's saying is if you, if you look at what the culture is calling us to do, it's calling us to treat one another as equals, and so basically to, to love as equals. But if you look at what the Bible calls, it's calling us to love our spouses like Christ loved the church. And how much more will we love our spouse if we love them like Christ loved the church than if we just treat them as equals? Right? It's a great point. And yeah. Like mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, that's that's it. And it ultimately, people enter marriage, and they don't know that they're doing this. But many people enter marriage with this this kind of contractual idea, like I'm going to satisfy your needs as long as you satisfy my needs, and it's it's like this business. But if we see ourselves as being called by God to fulfill a role, and that this is not a matter of of this our husband or our wife being what they're supposed to be in order for me to, to obey God, that it's just obedience to God because he loves me, he died for me because he's worthy of... Then, then we start um, thinking differently about how we treat our spouse because it no longer is about them. It's no longer about our marriage. It's about God. So, it's really important, really good. To your own husbands, God is not here establishing a broad relationship between all men and all women. That somehow the call of... A wife to submit to her husband means that wives are submissive to, to husbands, as a general rule. That's not it. Okay? It's to your own husband. He's also reminding wives of the unique responsibility that they have toward one man. And I've seen cases before where it seemed as though a wife was willing to submit to another person's husband because they had a great deal of respect for them or something like that, but they, they weren't willing to submit to their husband. And it's important here that you see the Bible says it's to your own husband. And then it goes on and it says, number three, as to the Lord. So you submit to your husband as if you were submitting to the Lord. And the, this phrase here has massive implications. Um, submission is, if submission is for the sake of your husband, then you will learn very quickly that he's not worth submitting for. He's going to fail you. He, he's he's going to mess up. He's going to make a decision that's not the right decision. And then you're going to question from that point on, should you really submit? Because look what happened last time you did. But if you realize that submission is as to the Lord, as if you're submitting to the Lord, then you realize that that this is not a a pragmatic calling. It's not just if if and when it works. 
It's not because he deserves it. It's not because he has earned it. Christ deserves your submission. Christ has earned your submission. He's worthy of your submission. And so you submit to him. And in submitting to him, you submit to your husband as the Lord. Um, R.C. Sproul said this. He said, It is Christ who commands women to be submissive to their sinful, fallible husbands. In this sense, Christ is the silent partner of the marriage. It is hard for a wife to submit when she disagrees with her husband. But when she knows her submission is an act of obedience to Christ and honors Christ, it is much less difficult. And finally, if you're submitting as the Lord, I think, I think it's important for you to remember that, that your reward or your judgment will ultimately be before the Lord. That you will either be rewarded for your obedience and your submission to your husband. It's not your husband that rewards that. It's, your, it's God that does. Or you will, you will stand in judgment for how you treated your, your husband. Um, because ultimately you're doing this for him and you'll stand before him someday. It is a decision that you make between you and God. The reason for it, why do we do this? Well, it's because it's your part in the role of displaying the relationship between God and the church. And you need two people to display that relationship well. It's not because your husband is smarter or more spiritual. It's not because you are too weak or too frail. It's not because you are inferior in any way, shape, or form. It is because God has a very special role that he's called you to to play that the husband cannot play. So the goal is should be to be a picture of the church's submission to Christ. And there's, I'm sure there's a lot more that could be said about that, but what, what I want us to just finish with here is that we recognize that in all of this, it's the gospel that's the priority. If it's the gospel that's the priority, if we are trying to be this picture then we must recognize that God has an, a purpose, an ordained purpose for gender and for our marriage. And within that, he has given us very clear instruction on how this is supposed to work to be the proper picture. So all of, all of this calling as a husband and as a wife is much bigger than just your calling because God decided randomly it's supposed to be that way. God has a a very specific purpose from the beginning of time for what a role wife was supposed to have, what a role husband was supposed to have, how men are designed, how women are designed, and all of it is ultimately to show the glory of God in the gospel. A man doesn't own his marriage, he is only a steward of his wife's love. And so if we would as men recognize that, that we are stewards in this, that we're doing this for God, if women would think the same thing, that a woman does not own her marriage, that she is a steward of her husband's love, if we would see these, see it this way, that God has given us this task, that your marriage is not just something to make you happy, but it's a calling from God to serve him in, in a new and specific way, we'd be much, much better off. Uh, Francis Chan wrote a book called You and Me Forever, and it's, the subtitle is Marriage in Light of Eternity. And I thought it was a really, really interesting book because when you open up a marriage book, you kind of expect to, to find tips and tricks on marriage, right? So this is how you resolve conflict, and this is how you communicate better, and this is what all these aspects of marriage look like. But when, when I read the book, I mean, I, I really, very little of the book touched on any of those things. Almost the entire book was written to get this in mind, in the, the reader's mind, that your call to marriage is a call to build the kingdom of God. That your call to marriage is now to work together to do what God had called you as individuals, individuals to do. So your marriage is in light of eternity. If you keep eternity in view, that someday the two of us will spend eternity somewhere, and someday those around us, those looking at our lives and looking at our marriage, that they will spend eternity somewhere, then you live differently then you start to to treat your spouse in the way that Christ treated the church because you know that's the best way to picture the gospel to your neighbors. That's the best way to show people around you that there's something unique and special, that God has done something transformative in your heart. If our marriages look slightly better than that of culture, and I think that that's probably a pretty good statement about a lot of marriages within a church. I like a lot of marriages in church are a little bit better than marriages in society. If that's all they look like, then people are going to come and they're just going to want to know that tip that, that, that sent you up that, that level, that step. But if our marriages look like something just different and glorious and, and wonderful, there's something uniquely different. 
there's not just a tip or trick that you're looking for. There's a whole way of thinking that's different. And that's what it needs to be for the Christian. Um, The mission of marriage is the joint venture of two coming together as one to pursue the mission and glory of God together by displaying the gospel of Jesus Christ in their marriage. Or the mission of marriage is the joint adventure of pursuing God together in deep friendship that spurs one another in, in your devotion to Christ. What if our marriages were us pursuing God together? We are to help each other to practically become who we are positionally in Christ. We are to help one another grow. How often do we get, we think about our marriages and we think, um, yeah, this is really for, for my growth. And, and this is really my goal here is to help my spouse grow in a relationship with Christ. That ultimately the relationship with Christ is the most important relationship in this marriage. It is worth working on. It is worth the hard work. It is worth reading the books. It is worth um, looking to wise counsel. Uh, some of the, one of the things I've noticed that I think is unfortunate is that people generally don't look for help until, until it's just about too late. Now, it's, it's never too late, but generally it takes everything collapsing and years and years of dysfunction before finally people look for help. What, what an incredible thing would it be if, if we said, you know what, I, I think our marriage is, is worth working on. I think it's worth fighting for. And what that means, it might mean a little bit of embarrassment, but I'm going to come and I'm going to talk to somebody and ask them if they'd, they'd help me to be a better spouse, if they'd help us sit together and work on our marriage so it can better display the gospel. If people would do that before it got to the point where this is the last straw, this is the last, last ditch effort, it'd be so much better. I think it's unfortunate that, that, that sometimes we're so private in our lives we don't want anybody to see in, and so we put a facade on. And, and I know our church isn't the tr- type of church that's all about facades, but we still, we still do this, right? We still have pride. We still want everybody to think that we have, like, A1 marriage. And, it, and those people that would actually step out of that comfort zone and say, you know what, I, I really want to work on my marriage, and I'm going to ask some people, ultimately, a year, or two, three years down the road, they would be the people that would have that glorious marriage, that would no longer need to put on a facade. So, do the hard work, read the books, read the Bible, um, study what the Word says, and ask for wise counsel. I'll close this part with this quote, and it's a, it's a longer quote, but I thought it was just a fantastic quote. It said, a marriage which does not... It, it's, this is by um, Alexander um, Sheeman. said, a marriage which does not constantly crucify its own selfishness and self-sufficiency which does not die to itself, that it may point beyond itself, is not a Christian marriage. I don't know if you could define a Christian marriage better than that, because I think it, it, it hits right against what most people go into marriage, their attitude. It, it's this selfishness, self-sufficiency, and we're being called to crucify that all the time. Why? So that we can point beyond ourselves. Otherwise, it's not a Christian marriage. The real sin of marriage today is not adultery or lack of adjustment or mental cruelty. It is the idolization of the family itself. The refusal to understand marriage as directed toward the kingdom of God. This is expressed in the sentiment that one would do anything for his family, even steal. So get, you've got to understand what he's saying here. Because he's saying that the idea that Marriage is, first, that our family is the most important thing, so much so that you'd be willing to sin to protect the family. He's saying that that you've missed this. It is the idolization, that you've just idolized the family. The family has here ceased to be for the glory of God. It is the idolization of the family that breaks the modern family so easily, making divorce its almost natural shadow. See, if you put all your stock in your marriage and all your stock in your family, and it's all about that, and you're willing to do anything for that, when that starts to break down, you've got nothing to hold on to. And it, break, it, it falls apart. But when, when God is number one, that he's not going to fall apart. right? He's not going to let you down. And so when he's number one, and you're pursuing him in your marriage, then this thing can be actually much stronger because it's built on a solid foundation. It is the identification of marriage with happiness and the refusal to accept the cross in it. In a Christian marriage, in fact, there are three that are married, and the united loyalty of the two toward the third, who is God, 
keeps the two in active unity which, with each other as well as with God. It is the cross of Christ that brings the self-sufficiency of nature to its end. But by the cross, joy entered the world. Its presence is thus the real joy of marriage. That was just a wonderful way of summarizing what a Christian marriage looked like. So, that's what a Christian marriage is. Now, uh, let's, let's spend the last few moments just talking about what we see in our culture, and that's the redefinition of marriage. Okay, we've, we've seen marriage redefined by our government. Um, on July 20th, 2005, Canada became the fourth nation in the world to redefine marriage as a whole country. Um, Ontario was ahead of the game. We did that in 2003. And we are the first country outside of Europe to do it. 50 years ago, the idea that this would happen, the thought that someday marriage would be redefined, that it would no longer be between one man and one woman, it would be been a ludicrous thought. Nobody would have believed that that's what was, what was coming, especially so soon in the future. And yet we've seen an incredibly rapid shift in one generation, a complete redefinition of what marriage looked like, redefinition of what um, our identity is, what gender looks like. All of these things are changing, and they're not just changing slowly, they're changing like in an instant. And it is a very unique time in history that this is happening. Uh, Many people would applaud this as progress. They would say that people have the right to love whomever they choose, and, and who are we to tell them that they can't love another person? Anyone with any different view than they have is seen as intolerant, backward, bigoted, homophobic, or whatever other word you want to use there. I'm sure you've heard many. And if history is our teacher, we don't have any reason to assume that things are going to get better quickly. We don't have a reason to think that all of a sudden one person getting elected is going to change how everything, the whole direction of society. What generally happens with, in societies, unless there's some kind of incredible revival, which we can pray for and we can hope for, but what generally happens is that societies become more and more debased and debauched and, and sinful until eventually they implode. That's, that's what history teaches us. As that happens, there's going to be more and more persecution among Christians. And so it's important for us to be very clear on why we believe what we believe and to, to hold our beliefs in the most loving way possible. So I want to give you five points to guide our thinking on same-sex marriage. Um, number one, the church has not always responded well to the world around us. Okay, this is the first point because the point is designed, to, is designed to instill in us a little bit of humility. To say that the church has not always done a great job of this. That for a long time, our natural response to people, when, when we found that out, we found out they were homosexual, that they were attracted to somebody of the same sex. When we found that out, um, we responded in a very unloving and hateful way. And admitting that and saying that we have a lot to learn is probably a good start. Now, Thankfully, I have seen that over the past five, maybe even ten years, there has been a, a lot of people rethinking how they think about homosexual marriage. Now, it took too long for us to get there, but I believe that within Christendom, we're seeing more and more people seeing this is truth, we must hold truth, but how do we hold truth in love and trying to do those things well? And there's been a great number of books published recently by Christian authors that do an, an, a wonderful job of defending marriage between one man and one woman, but also speaking of marriage in love. So if you're ever interested in one of those books, let me know, and I have a few in my office. We must, as a church, be committed to loving all people for whom Jesus died. Should be an obvious statement. But if you think about the ramifications of that statement, we must be committed to loving all people, homosexual people included, for whom Jesus died. We must recognize ourselves to be sinners equally worthy of God's justice, who are children of God only by God's grace. We must not at any point lift ourselves, think ourselves any better than a sinner, another sinner, no matter what their sin is. We must destigmatize homosexual behavior as some kind of cardinal sin. I think as John MacArthur said, homosexual behavior is 
a perverse sexual behavior just like all others. The point was, we have wrong sexual thoughts all the time. It's, this is not something that's unique to homosexual people. This is something that heterosexuals experience on a regular basis. And so don't think that we're somehow better. So number one, the church has not always responded well to the world around us. Let's admit that. Let's be humble about how we approach this. Number two, the church has a responsibility to the love and the truth of Christ. So when people say, well, Christ loved people. Shouldn't you love people? You're a Christian. You should be loving. The answer is yes, absolutely. We should be. We should be loving people as Christ loved people. But Christ was also a proponent of truth. He's called the way, the truth, and the life. And so we must be just as for the truth of Christ as we are for the love of Christ. And those two things, if you look at what the Bible says, those two things actually can't be separated. You can't really love someone without truth, and you can't really tell the truth properly without love. So, um, whether we like it or not, Christians, Christ followers, must follow the teaching of the Bible and of Jesus in this incredibly important subject. Number three. The Bible is abundantly clear that homosexual behavior is sinful and is contrary to God's design for gender. The Bible is abundantly clear that homosexual behavior is sinful. It is contrary to God's original design. Remember, uh, there's many verses we go to. I just want to read Romans chapter 1, verses 24 to 27. It says, Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even the, their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. Um, Leviticus chapter 18. I mean, there, there are many, many verses throughout Scripture that make this point clear. Um, that homosexual behavior is sinful. Now, some would say something like, well, um, they're talking about a, a cultural practice that was going on then, where young men were being taken by older men and basically used as sexual slaves, and that this is what he's condemning there. And the problem is, the Bible never specifies that. The Bible never makes that clear. In fact, it says that they're burning lust one toward another, that the lust is mutual there. And so, when we look at what what the Bible says about it, um, the, the Bible never gives any indication that in any place homosexual behavior is okay. And this was the Jewish understanding of the sexual ethic. It, Jews recon, recognized this to be true since the time of the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. This is how, how they believed God had commanded them to live. And so um, this is how it's always been understood. And that's very important because when we come to the New Testament, a lot of people will say something like, well, Jesus didn't really ever condemn homosexual, homosexuality. I think Jesus would just love all people. Well, he did. He did because he said... First of all, that marriage was created by God as one man and one woman. So he defined what marriage is. Any sex outside of marriage is called fornication. And so Jesus was very clear in the New Testament that fornication is sinful, right? So that covers it. Jesus didn't have to specifically speak about incest. He didn't have to specifically speak about bestiality. He didn't have to specifically speak about... um, the relationship between any heterosexual person with another heterosexual person that they're not married to. He didn't have to specify what he meant. When he said fornication, everybody knew what he meant, and that included homosexual behavior. So he did condemn homosexuality. And so when we look to the Bible, I think it's important as Christians that we don't try and brush this off. We don't try and pretend it doesn't exist. I appreciate more the Christians who say, uh, this is going to sound bad, but the Christians who say, you know what, I don't think we need to follow the Bible here, I think it's irrelevant, but they recognize what the Bible actually teaches. Okay, that is, it's better than twisting the Bible to suit what you, th- what you want it to teach. It, it's just very clear. So, that leads us to number four. Only God has the authority to define 
and to redefine marriage. If, if, if a union, if marriage is a union between one man and one woman where God brings them together and creates one flesh, it's a supernatural union, only God can do that. Only God can bring two people together as one. Marriage was given specific boundaries and exists for a central purpose. And a homosexual marriage cannot fulfill the, that purpose. Homosexual marriage cannot, does not fit within those boundaries. Well, one might argue, okay, yeah, I get it. But when we look to the Bible, we see a lot of different purposes for marriage. And some of those things include child rearing. Um, some of those include sexual pleasure. Some of those include companionships. Like, you, you go on the list, friendship. I mean, when we look at those things, we say, yeah, okay, well, there are some um, heterosexual married couples who are unable to have kids. Does that mean they shouldn't be married? No, right? Well, how about people who are unable to enjoy sexual pleasure anymore? Should they not be married? We wouldn't say that. Well, what about people who maybe the person they're married to is no longer an adequate companion for them? Should they just end that marriage? And then they might say, well, homosexual marriage can fulfill a lot of those things. It might, it might not be able to check off every box, but it can check off most, so why is that not sufficient? And, and this, is, this is the problem. All of those things are potential benefits of marriage, but they're not necessary to the definition of marriage. All of those things are, are things that, that marriage can help with, and they can be a, a secondary goal, potentially, or a secondary purpose, but they're not the main purpose. The main central purpose of marriage is to show the gospel, and this is Christ as the husband who gives himself for his wife and the wife who is submitting herself willingly to her husband. It requires two genders. It requires two different things. That's how God created in the first place. That's the, the, the primary purpose for marriage. And so all of those other things, there are benefits. There may be secondary goals or secondary purposes, but they're not the, the main reason. God defined it very clearly for us. So if God is the one who defined marriage, he is the, he is the only one who has the authority to redefine marriage. And what I'm saying is, if God doesn't redefine something, then it's not that thing. And it doesn't matter who calls it that. It doesn't matter what government sanctions it. It's not that thing. So when people wonder, what do we make of the law of the land? What should we be doing? Well, I mean, certainly we recognize that it, it, when we get the opportunity, then we, could, we should speak truth, and we should try and stand for what's right, and we should vote for the candidate that we think is best going to represent our viewpoints, etc. But I don't think that all of a sudden we have a lot of homosexual people that are, that are married, because I think God defined what marriage is. And I, I really don't think, if the government decides to call that, call that union a marriage, if the government decides to give whatever tax breaks come along with that, okay, it's a secular government. And, and I'm, not, I'm not expecting them to act like God would act. And so I don't, I'd prefer it not happen, but it's, it's not going to destroy my life. It doesn't going to destroy what I think about marriage or what marriage actually is, because God is the one that set it up. He defines it. I don't think God is impressed, but I don't think that when, in July 20th, 2005, um, God threw up his hands and said, well, there goes that plan. I don't think God was like, oh, the whole plan for marriage was just destroyed when Canada decided to legalize homosexual marriage. It, it wasn't. I think God is much more concerned about what his children do with their marriages than the tax breaks that any culture is going to give to people who call themselves married. I think God is so much more concerned about his church than he is about the culture. I really think that sometimes we get so focused on the direction of society that we don't realize that our responsibility isn't society. It really isn't. Our responsibility is the church. It is to be a light. It is to be within our own sphere of influence to be what we're supposed to be. And what happens out there, it's going to happen. And it might get worse, and that's not our fault necessarily if we're doing everything that we can do. But what, what happens is, when Christians do the right thing with their marriage, and when we focus on the church, and we try and change what we're, what we're responsible to change, then that will eventually impact the culture around us. It will impact the world. But we've got to do it God's way. Right? We've got to do it the way that God set out, and that is through um, our own personal lives, our own marriages, our own churches, from the inside out. That's the way that God designed for us to impact the world.
Don't you think that one of the reasons that the culture is going the way it is is because the church has compromised, mm -hmm. allowed so many things to occur that were just on that slippery slope? And yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think that it's the church is compromised, but I think it, that a lot of it is the compromise happened because the church wasn't what it was supposed to be in the first place. And so because the church wasn't, wasn't pursuing godly, holy marriages that represented the gospel, then when a new idea came up, we said, well, it's not much different than what we're doing now. Well, yeah, it's not. It's, it's supposed to be. It should be shocking, but it's not shocking. It's not way different. Um, one of the ways that I think that we're helping to be in how we share truth or how we love people is realize that it's not loving for us to allow somebody or to condone someone to behave in a way that God did not give them. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And that's, that's the idea of, of truth and love being joined. That if you really love somebody, then you can't want something for them that God doesn't want for them. Because ultimately that is going to lead to, it's not going to lead to their joy, it's going to lead to um, their demise, their destruction. I've just been reading Revelation, and uh, the first judgment starting into the tribulation is the white horse, which is deception. Satan is the ruler of this world, and he's a deceiver from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. He's attacked marriage, and he's going to attack everything and become a false Christ. But we should be aware that um, he's the great deceiver, mm -hmm. and he attacks whatever God loves. Yep, that's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, Christians need to be aware. Yep. No, so I think, you know. If one of the spouses becomes incapable of looking after himself and the other stands by the other one until death do part, his total commitment when they still walk hand in hand is a sign of deep devotion. It is. Absolutely. And we should we should understand that when we're making that, that covenant, we're not we're making the covenant as it as it said, to death do part. When you get older, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's something that is gonna become more and more relevant as people age. Oh, we should finish up because I don't wanna go here again next week. So, number five, conversations that we have with our culture, with our neighbors, with our friends, conversations about marriage and homosexuality should always have a goal in mind. So this is the, this is the practical part. So once we get to the place where we're thinking biblically about marriage, we should recognize that we need to have a goal in mind when we speak to people. And if we have a goal in mind when we speak to people, it will help um, direct the, our conversation. It will help direct how, what we say and how we say it and, and why we say what we say. Because we have a purpose. We have a goal there. So, this is my point. If your goal is political, if you're hoping to politically convince somebody they should, they should vote or think along, along these lines, then you're going to use statistics or you're going to use history, then you use facts. And listen, you can, you can use those things. There are statistics and history and facts that will back up your position if you believe marriage should be between one man and one woman. It, it always has been. That's the way families flourish. That's the way countries flourish. And there are some negative health risks with homosexual behavior. So there's just a lot of political reasons, if that's your goal. If your goal is personal, that you want to win an argument, then I would recommend um, personal attacks, bullying, ostracizing, generally making fun of another person and putting them down. Because I've seen many people win arguments this way. So if you're hoping to personally just win the argument, then take that person and really like make them feel like they're nothing. If your goal is to be a gospel witness, you can't do those things, right? Okay, you were hoping I'd get there eventually. <laughs> Most of you probably knew I would. Maybe some of you weren't sure. If you want to be a gospel witness, then you love people, you love sinners like Christ loved them, and you speak truth. Jenny Morrison, I think, encapsulated this when she said to her friend, her friend had come out as a homosexual, and she, her friend came to her and said, well, what do you think? She said, well, I think I believe the Bible, I know what the Bible says, but I love you. And I'm and kind of, a, I'm always here for you, I, I'm willing, you know, and I think that, that's about right. And if we would just put a different face on this sin, if we would say, well, this person struggles with stealing or this person struggles with pornography, or this person, then maybe we'd have a better understanding of how to treat the person in love. That, that, that sin is something that they do, right? And so maybe what they're doing, it offends us. But ultimately, the sin is against God. And their problem is not that they're committing such and such sin. Their problem is that they're a sinner, the problem is never just the sin. I'm going to talk about this tonight, actually, in my last episode preview. Um, 
the problem is that they're a sinner, and we're all sinners. And so treat them as a sinner for whom Christ died. Okay? And if we will have a conversation with a gospel witness being our goal, then I think we'll have much better conversations with the world around us. All right? I'm going to close this marriage thing with this quote, and then we're done. If we love the preaching of the gospel from the pulpits, then we will also love the display of the gospel in marriages. Churches must not be neutral or casual about what so rejoices the heart of God. It's Roy Ortland. So thank you.